But I encourage you, if you do, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ruth chapter 3. But we're going to go to Jeremiah first. In Jeremiah 31, it says this. It says, this is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love and I have drawn you with an unfailing kindness. And so rest. The Lord allows hardships in our lives for his purposes. But he also intends us and his people to find rest and grace in him. And hardships and rest, sometimes we think those are contradictory things. But instead, we just don't see that the hardships are actually leading us to our place of rest. And we find in this love story practical applications of the laws of Moses of obtaining that rest. So in Deuteronomy 25, 5, and 6, this is how this chapter starts as far as the laws of Moses and incorporating those. It says, if brothers are living together, one of them dies without a son, his widow must, marry, must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the, same, the name of the dead brother, so that this name will not be blotted out from Israel. Now, when you look at that, who has the right to claim this law of succession? Whose right is that? Is it the brother-in-law? Is it his right? Is it the family's right? Whose right is it? It's the widow's. The widow has the right to make this claim. Okay? And so <clears throat> it is something she can demand of the surviving brother or any kinsman. And there is a provision that if the man doesn't fulfill her request, he is to be marked and is open to shame in the nation of Israel. Now, if this is so, and it is, then we can further contemplate who Naomi pictures and who Ruth pictures and what the ultimate purpose of the book of Ruth is given to us for. Each chapter and each verse is leading us through a snapshot of a portion of redemptive, redemptive history and it's showing us at the same time the marvelous work of God in and through his son, Jesus Christ. And you're going to see that. We've seen that some through chapters 1 and 2, but it's now going to become very apparent in chapter 3. In chapter 2, it was Ruth who initiates the actions to sustain their lives and activate the rights of the law that provides for the stranger and the widow. Boaz provided the field. He provided the opportunity and the resources for a place for Ruth to glean. But the law requires the stranger to go to the field, gather the grain, prepare and eat the grain. Ruth wasn't sent to the fields. She volunteered. She initiated that action. Ruth provided the means to meet the physical needs of both her and Naomi. Now in chapter 3, we're going to see something different. It is Naomi who directs the action towards securing a place of rest for Ruth. In chapter 2, Ruth demonstrated her faithfulness to Naomi. In this chapter, Ruth is going to demonstrate her obedience to Naomi. So Ruth 3.1. One day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter... I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now, this first verse already has a little bit of controversy because Bible translations differ in how this is uh, seen or said. It says, some of them say, shall I not seek security? Or should I not find you a husband? Or shall I not seek rest? Well, the Bible translations differ in the way they interpret what Naomi is seeking for Ruth. The specific Hebrew worrying word is manoach 
And Joseph Parker, who was a congregational minister, commentator, this particular, particular boat, uh, verse. Manoach, meaning rest, means an asylum of rest, a protection of honor, security that cannot be violated. And then its last significance, it means the very omnipotence and pavilion of God. In this respect, Boaz was the type of Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's been my experience when sharing about salvation. I tend to rely a lot on, you know, talking about hell versus heaven or everlasting life versus death. But here's where I'm not very I could make a better point because this is the Bible's point. I have not been consistent with the concept of chaos and labor and rest. Isn't that what people really want? Who wants to live ever after if it's going to be work all the time? You want to live ever after and have eternal life in the sense of its rest. And I want to be more diligent in relaying that to people when I'm trying to lead them to salvation. Because really that's the most important. And I think that can make a better point than really anything else of why do you want to accept Christ as your Savior. Jesus is our rest. He's our contentment and our peace. He offers assurance. And he tells us the reason for our rest in Isaiah 62. Like the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you lead your people to make for yourself a glorious name. What's the rest for? For us? It's to give glory to God. So God is glorified. Rest is explicitly stated in Hebrews 4. For we who have believed enter that rest. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let's make every effort to enter that rest. And God's word has given us that information. That is the highlight. In chapter 2, Boaz connected to Naomi's husband, Elimelech, as a relative, specifically to Naomi. But now in this chapter, he is called our relative, meaning Naomi and Ruth. Yes, it's Naomi's relative through marriage to Elimelech, but it's also Ruth's relative through her marriage to Elimelech's son. The Hebrew wording creates a connection between the two, which implies that there should be knowledge on the part of Boaz toward his responsibilities as their relative. So she shows up to the field, and then he kind of finds out who she is, and then he kind of realizes, oh, well, this could be, this is one of my relatives. But we don't see him going, hey, can I help you out? He doesn't do that. As Ruth possessed the right to glean, she possesses the right to be redeemed by a near relative. As she initiated the process to glean, by law, by law, she will need to initiate the process to be redeemed. Now, we often don't think about that. We think that, oh, Boaz should say, hey, do we need to get married because that's what I'm supposed to do? That's not what Boaz's right is. It is Ruth who has to make that request. In this culture at this time, it was custom for the parent to participate in the process of marriage. Ruth will require the knowledge of Naomi to understand and to carry out these customs. She's, not, she's a Moabite. She doesn't know, but Naomi does. Like Ruth, we as Gentiles need guidance from the Hebrew Scriptures, do we not? And the Jewish customs of Israel, which Naomi is representing. Within these verses, we can see the biblical truths of salvation made available by our God. And according to his law, it is a right we possess. We have the right for salvation. 
and it requires an action we must initiate in order for redemption to take place. The Holy Spirit doesn't force us. We have to exercise that. A good example of God's redemptive process is during the Exodus. He gave them a law to place blood over the doors of their houses. He gave them this promise in Exodus 12. He says, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. They had to initiate that. No blood, no protection. There's blood that you initiated, then there's protection. God allows us to be obedient to him, and he allows us to initiate the actions which his law requires and offers in the redemption process. Picture of man's free will in election. Though God knows what that free will is going to be and the choices we're going to make, he still requires us to initiate that choice. I believe God doesn't selectively choose some for salvation and some to be condemned if some Calvinist doctrines believe. There are churches that believe that. Hey, we don't need to witness to you because, you know, if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved. But we don't know who is and who isn't. God only knows. Verse 2, you look at verse 2, Naomi's spirit gets back. Man, she's excited about her matchmaking plans. It's like, oh boy, I know where he'll be tonight. She knows this is the perfect time to meet Boaz. It's night, it's outside the city, and away from his home. After the winnowing, there would be an evening feast with his harvesters. Boaz would remain alone, protecting his work through the night after all the harvesters left. Having a full stomach and a happy with maybe a little bit of wine, he would be in a good mood because of the satisfaction of an excellent day of harvest. He would lay among the grain content with the labor of his hands. It would make for the perfect time and the place for Ruth to exercise that right of redemption. Naomi had observed enough to know that both of them were suited for each other and that both of them were inclined towards one another. And so she directs Ruth to Boaz's threshing floor. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not reveal yourself to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Oops. Yeah. Ruth would have been routinely wearing, if you think about it, widow's garments, right? Soiled from the dirt of the field, stained from the sweat of her brow. For the first time since being in Bethlehem, she will now adorn herself in beautiful apparel and be spruced up in a most radiant way. What a picture. Her clothes would smell wonderful, her face would glow from the bath that she cooked, and her hair would be shiny and soft with just a handful of olive oil. During the Old Covenant with Israel, God describes Israel through Ezekiel in a very similar way. Then I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. I went over you and covered your nakedness. And I also swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. Then I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from you, and anointed you with oil. Is that not Naomi at this point? Or Ruth at this point? If the covenant of Israel is compared to Ruth's appearance, think about this, then Ruth... A Gentile who is meeting with Boaz must be picturing a new covenant, a new covenant with the Lord. Listen to how Paul describes us as the church and how closely it matches what we would think of Ruth at this time. Listen to this, and it comes from Ephesians. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish 
but holy and blameless. Are you seeing a picture? If the story were merely to introduce Ruth as an ancestor of David and Jesus, then you just have a short note and a genealogical record, maybe somewhere in Chronicles. That would have done it. We don't need this whole big story. But instead, more detail is given in this one story than any other such story of this type in the Bible. Every word is given to show us of a greater story of love, redemption, and restoration. Every person mentioned is emblematic of another figure or a precept which leads to the work of Jesus Christ. God has taken these real people with their truly human needs and their desires and has used them as examples of his redemption for the entire people of the world. Christopher Stark, a German theologian, made these comments about this specific verse to draw us to this parallel. It says, the bride, the bride of Christ is pleasing to her bridegroom only when anointed with the Spirit and clothed in the garments of salvation. Without these, we cannot be a part of God's plan of redemption. But with them, we are His once and forevermore. We are redeemed. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself. But then it says, but do not reveal yourself. Now, the term reveal here in this verse is referring to the intentions of the seeing the person. You know, it looks like, you know, he's still going to see you, but don't tell him why you're there. She probably went at the time of the evening feast, which they would have had at the end of the day, in order to be seen by him, but that she wouldn't make herself or her intentions known until a later time. She could request redemption publicly, like at the city gates or at his home or maybe even during the feast. But why would Naomi suggest such secrecy for Ruth to request her redemption? Why would she do that? Most of the time it's done in a public setting. Mm -hmm. Boaz is not the closest relative. Hmm. There is one who is closer, as we will see in a few verses. If she were to come and claim the right in public, as abruptly say to her, she had to follow the letter of the law. And just end it there and says, you've got to go ask somebody else. But she didn't do that. And Ruth, and Naomi didn't instruct Ruth to do that. Naomi suggests to follow the intent of the law mixed with a little pleasing and humble attitude. Boaz would still follow the letter of the law, but he would find a way much more conducive to a favorable outcome for a marriage. In other words, Ruth, you go make the request humbly and privately. And then you let Boaz figure out how he's going to make all this happen. That's his responsibility. Your job is just to request. If that doesn't sound like us before the law, relying on the work of Christ rather than our own works, is there a better picture than that right there? And it is the nation Israel that God has presented himself through. Jesus was Jewish. Israel has maintained the scriptures. The Jewish apostles explained and instructed the words and the works of Jesus. It was Ruth who had to rely on Naomi's knowledge. We as Gentiles today have to rely on the Jewish scriptures and the apostles of Jesus, what they wrote. You see the parallels? Boaz is one of, to perform the redemption when he's asked. And he had implicitly demonstrated his desire to do so through the care he previously showed her. She was taken care of. The extra sheaves were dropped. He did things for her in the field. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. He calls us participation of understanding. But it is we who have to respond to that call. Ruth 
would not have summoned up the courage to approach Boaz unless she really desired him as a husband and she knew that she would be accepted by him. Because of Boaz's actions, he gave her the faith to come forward to be redeemed. Did he not? We see this same concept expressed by Paul in Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that through Christ's loving actions, what he did toward us, for us, faith to call him for salvation. It's credit to the Lord, is it not? This is the story of Boaz and Ruth. This is what it's all about. So verse 6, it says, So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. Now, <clears throat> this picture is a restored ancient threshing floor site near the present-day town of Bethlehem. Now keep in mind that the threshing floor is usually on the top of a hill or elevated to allow the breeze to be used to separate the chaff from the seed. Now, throughout the Bible, we see direction indicating the spiritual or the social importance of a place by the way it is traveled to or traveled from. For example, anytime you see travel from a place to Jerusalem, it is always said one is going up to Jerusalem. Even if the elevation would be going down, because there are hills and mountains around Jerusalem itself that are higher than the city of Jerusalem. So the city or town where one lived would be more important than the threshing floor. You see that? So that's why she went down. A march up in elevation, but in the spiritual sense, in the social sense, she went down to it. Verse 7, when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. A person, you know, is normally in a better mood after having first had a little to eat, maybe a little to drink, and their belly is full. They're in a good mood. We see this same approach in the book of Esther. Before requesting any kind of important matter before the king of Persia, what does Esther do first? Provides a big banquet for him. You women know you can make a man pretty happy if you keep his belly full, right? You know that. <laughs> Ecclesiastes says this about a laborer and how it affects his sleep. It says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. Now, verse 8. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He was scared. He didn't know what it could have been an animal. Was it a burglar? What, what was at his feet? He didn't know. It's dark. And so he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your slave. Now spread your garment over your slave, for you are a redeemer. She humbly acknowledges Boaz is capable, if he is willing. This allows us or shows us that Ruth and Naomi understand they know they understand that there is another relative close because she does not use the word you are the redeemer and this is important in the Hebrew again we see her purity her love and her noble actions of Ruth and then in turn Boaz acknowledges Ruth then he said you may be blessed May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than your first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Boaz's response shows that he recognizes Ruth's actions. He understands what she's doing as being pure and noble. He also continues by saying to her and calling her my daughter. He is making no commitment to stir her emotions or hint she is to him than when she arrived at his feet. He does praise her for her actions as Boaz is saying she has been faithful 
from, ta- from the time she married into the family of Israel and left her gods, her land, and her family. When her husband died, she remained faithful to Naomi and the God of Israel. She could have left the family and left God's law by going after one of the young men. She shut out her personal desires for wealth or physical pleasure. However, her desire was to honor and love her new chosen family and God by allowing the name of Elimelech and Mahon, her husband, to continue and provide and protect for Naomi also. So now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you say. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. But now, although it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is is also a redeemer more closely related than I. It is most certain. Well, let me back up. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. He's just making a vow. That other guy doesn't do it, I will do it. Lie down until morning. It is most certain by Ruth's voice that she was trembling when she spoke. And Boaz assures her that her actions are found as okay. What you did was okay. Now just rest. Set here through the night. Now, the word city in this translation or town, in other translations, uh, well, in in English translations, it always says city or town. And that's not what exactly the Hebrew says. The Hebrew uses the word gate. The gate, as we had discussed previously, is what our present-day courthouse would be like. Those who sat at the gate were the elders and the judges of the city. The Hebrew in this verse is literally says, the gate of my people. These elders and judges would be well aware of this noble character that Ruth has been exhibiting when, since she had arrived at Bethlehem. They would have seen this. They would have seen her leave each morning and return each evening. They would have seen the threshed and winnowed grain that she brought in would be, filling, would be filled into our basket. And so all the difficult work of doing all of that she would already be done, and it would not require Naomi to even do that. She was doing that work for both of them. Boaz acknowledges that he is a relative capable of redeeming, but it would be against the law if there is another relative closer, and of course there is. Obedience to the law, customs, and culture are more important than Boaz's own desires. His personal emotions could not interfere with what is right according to the law. He had to do it by the law. This would probably be the longest night of Ruth's life. As she lies back down, her mind begins to contemplate all that was just happened. She was, or she has to be given a promise that she will be redeemed and the name of her late husband will be raised up. This has been assured to her But her desire to be redeemed by Boaz, will it be him? I don't know. Could be the other guy. We don't know. Boaz may have trouble sleeping as well as he is contemplating his course of action, planning what to say, when to say it, who to say it to, and maybe even where to say it. What will be the reactions and the responses? Mulling over all these possible scenarios. His first thought is of Ruth, though, and for her safety and protection for the rest of the evening. At such a late hour, only troublemakers and wild animals would be out, and she could be harmed. And the guards at the gate would be far less friendly, especially, especially to an unaccompanied young woman. And we see this in the Song of Solomon, where it says, the watchman who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guards of the walls took my shawl away from me. So it could happen. He's thinking of her here. So she lay down at his feet until morning and got up before one person could recognize another. And he said, 
do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. The kindness of Boaz had shown, that was shown to her must have made her heart yearn for that nearer kinsman to refuse the offer. No matter the nearer kinsman's age or wealth or position within the society, that didn't matter to Ruth. In another person, she would have only uncertainty. She had the certainty of Boaz's actions. Matthew Henry, in the, late, in the early 1700s, was, he, he's a theologian that always looks at ways to picture Christ in the Old Testament. And he says this, This narrative may encourage us to lay ourselves by faith at the feet of Christ. He is our near kinsman, having taken our nature upon him. He has the right to redeem. Let us seek to receive from him his directions. Ruth lay herself at Boaz's feet, awaiting his directions. Even to this day, we use that same terminology for obtaining instruction from a wiser person than ourselves. To sit at the feet of someone indicates a reverential fear or even a desire to learn from that person, doesn't it? It is the place of submission and even servitude and Matthew and Luke confirm this for us. Says, and behold, Jesus met Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and said, Rejoice! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Luke says, Then came, uh, they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. So... She lay at his feet until morning and got up before one person could recognize another. This early departure was necessary. It was a necessary precaution to preserve the integrity of both Ruth and Boaz so that the events coming later that day would not seem to be preplanned or deceiving as what was about to, expire, to transpire. Okay? Do not let it be known that the woman, meaning Ruth, came to the threshing floor. Now, the NIV uses the word a woman, but the Hebrew is very specific here. It specifically is saying, you, Ruth, do not tell anyone. Boaz is concerned about her integrity being stained or a potential of, uh, or a perception of he and Ruth maybe colluding to create the outcome of their desires. And he and Ruth may have been intimate with each other. That didn't want to be, didn't want to see that possibility. So Boaz is acting very fairly and judiciously at this point. He's taking care of Ruth, but he's given her specific instructions. He has acknowledged that there is a kinsman closer than he, and the kinsman, that closer kinsman, must be given the first opportunity to accept or decline Ruth's right of redemption. There is an order which Boaz will ensure is to be followed so that all is being done according to the law perfectly. No shortcuts, no setups, and no backroom deals to ensure an outcome that they may have desired. In this interaction, we see the perfect picture of Christ who came in a proper fashion to redeem under the law. He didn't circumvent the law parameters of the law who redeem us. And Paul explains this in Galatians. He says this, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, unborn under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that, they, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Now, Bible scholar Peter Lang describes Boaz's actions this way. He says, it would have been very unpleasant for Boaz to have people connect himself with any woman in a suspicious way. But scandalous rumors of this kind, with Ruth being the object of those scandals, because remember, he's well-respected within the community, so who's going to get the brunt? Ruth would. That would have been very injurious to her. To say nothing of the fact that an unobserved stain would have been fixed on the good name of Ruth. It would have rendered it very difficult for him to prosecute her claims in the city of Bethlehem. 
And again he said, give me your shawl that is on you and hold it. So she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. Now, if you ask me, this is a very strange verse. At first glance, we might say, okay, okay already. Boaz gave her some grain for breakfast. What happens when he or she goes into the city? Let's get to the meat of the story. Come on. Who cares about what he's given her? If we rush this dialogue, we will miss the seasoning of this entire story. Boaz measured what? Measures. How much is a measure? Some translations will say scoops or handfuls, cups or buckets. But the Hebrew does not give a measurement. The unit of measures are not what's important. Yet we are given an exact number of what those measures were. There are three separate and distinct points of importance for us to consider that God gives us here. And point one is twofold. First, why give her some grain? Well, if you think about it, do you think Ruth is even hungry? Is she thinking about breakfast? Probably not. If she were to walk home wearing her best shawl and her best clothing, smelling good, looking good, not in her dingy, widow gleaning clothes that she had always worn before, she would certainly be noticed. Some might suppose that she had been out all night, more than just burning the midnight oil. Instead, she would appear far less suspicious if her pretty shawl was full of grain. People might think, oh man, that poor girl, she had worked so late all night long and was gleaning through the night, fell asleep, and now she's finally returning. This would improve her image, not diminish it. Second, the grain was a gift for Naomi. She would be considered the parent of Ruth. And according to one scholar of ancient cultural norms, Dr. Cook, S.A. Cook, he said, it was the widowed mother who was to be approached with a gift of the bridegroom. Since the father's not there, the mother would be in charge of that. So Naomi would be the one that should receive the gift. Now point two and three. Why six? Why not two, ten, or a dozen measures of barley? Why six? And that brings the next point. Why barley? This encounter occurs at the end of the grain harvesting season, which would be during the wheat harvest. Why barley here? In 1894, E.W. Bullinger's published a book titled Numbers in Scripture. His work is the standard for study in the meaning of numbers in the Bible. He wrote this about the number six. Has to do with man. It is the number of imperfection, the human number, the number of man as destitute of God, without God and without Christ. It is certain that man was created on the sixth day, and thus he has the number six impressed upon him. Moreover, six days were appointed to him for his labor, while one day is associated in sovereignty with the Lord God as his rest. Six, therefore, is the number of labor also, of man's labor as a part and distinct from God's rest. True, it marks the completion of creation as God's work, and therefore the number is significant of worldly or secular completeness. Bullinger tries to tie this number, he does tie this number six in with the labors, and that at the end of the labors there is the anticipation of the Lord God and his rest. It is exactly what Naomi was seeking for Ruth and for herself through Ruth. One cannot enter rest until the work is done. Not the work of salvation, just the earthly toil to survive because of the sin that was in the garden. We still have to work. 
Peter Lang gives us these words to consider. He says, Naomi receives what she may take as an intimation that the time has come when after long labor she must let Ruth go out free. The day of rest is at hand. Naomi's got to be thinking this and proud of it. Now barley is seen to picture the resurrection of Christ because barley was presented at the first fruits, the feast of first fruits. It was the first crop to mature, barley is. So we read this in Leviticus. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give to you and you gather its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Paul in the New Testament shows that this feast was fulfilled in Christ's resurrection. But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. Barley is also known as the crop of hairy ears because of its hairy appearance. And hair, and this could be a whole other study sometime, but hair in the Bible represents an awareness of sin. The time of the barley harvest, first fruits, which come forth at the same time of God's Son from the grave. The barley design resembling hair or an awareness of sin. And then the six measures, the imperfection of man in his labor, working toward that rest. All of it. All of this is just tasty little seasonings that are added to the meat of this story. God uses real, tangible things to show us his spiritual truths about his son, Jesus. English translations of this last statement in verse 15 are split about 50-50. Half say she went, the other half say he went. The Hebrew is specific, it is masculine, and should translate as he went. The Hebrew, uh, and, and anyway, both of them have missions to perform. Hers is to what? To go back to Naomi. His is to go to the city gates and to bring Ruth's redemption to a completion. The use of he creates a true picture of Christ. It was Jesus who rode into the city of Jerusalem and accomplish the work necessary to redeem his people, just like Boaz is doing here for Ruth. In the early 1600s, the English bishop Joseph Hall summarizes this night at the threshing floor. He says this, Boaz, instead of touching her as a wanton, which means like a pervert, blessed her as a father, encourages her as a friend, promises her as a kinsman, rewards her as a patron, and sends her away laden with hopes and gifts, no less chaste, but more happy than she came. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her, which was what? Boaz had made a promise. He will secure a kinsman redeemer for Ruth, be it a closer relative or himself. She is going to be redeemed. She also said, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Again, she's a Moabite. She said, I don't know why he wanted me to bring this to you. But Naomi understands. She knows exactly why this gift is being brought to her. To Ruth and Naomi, the barley gift is a sign of hopeful betrothal. It is significant, now listen to this, it is significant that the barley passes from a Gentile to a Jew and not the other way around. Though it originally came from a Jewish man, it went through Ruth and then to Naomi. It is the church, it is the Gentiles who have carried the word. 
And it's what the church has done. And one day, and we read this in Revelation, one day we're going to give that charge back to the 144,000 of Israel. And they're going to do what they were originally designed to do when God called Israel. Today, think about the church in Israel. Despite Boaz's intentions to betroth Ruth, if possible, he still maintained compassion for and a desire to support Naomi. Is the nation of Israel being taken care of? Didn't seem like it 100 years ago, 200 years ago. But what do we see now? Again, it is important consideration to understand this entire scope of what is being pictured here. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Wait. Now, other translations use sit still, be still, be patient. Sit and wait. Relax, honey. Sit down. Ruth is anxious. She's excited, full of energy and desire. Is the church anxiously waiting? Are we excited, full of energy, and desiring our bridegroom? We should be. We should be just like Ruth. Everything so far has been carefully detailed and recorded for the sole purpose for us to see the work of Ruth is a story of great love and affection, both in the physical story, but also in the, also in the spiritual authority, the spiritual story that it represents. Jesus went about the business set before him to redeem a bride. He followed the law to the letter, fulfilling it completely. Christ is now waiting patiently for the fullness of times to come. And we know this because Matthew records the words of Jesus. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls.